Hey guys, my name is Jared Healy, and I'm so glad to be a part of Life Community Church serving as the tech lead. Our mission here is to help people know Jesus personally and serve him passionately. If you're new here, you feel free to subscribe so you can stay up to date with our latest content. But right now, let's get ready for the message. We delight to do your will, O oh God. Can you say that with me? We delight to do your will, O oh God. We delight. It's the desire of our heart. Lord, we want to make you smile. We want to bring you happy tears. Is that okay to say? Do you know what happy tears are? They're better than sad tears. Amen? Hey, Lord, we, Lord, Lord, it is the desire of our heart to make you smile. Lord, it is the desire of our heart to bring tears to your heart. You know how it is. Those kids, they do something special. Grandkids do something special. I, I, I had my grandson, Russ, I, I was gone for about a week, and I took my mom someplace, and I came back, and I'd been gone. I hadn't seen him in eight or ten days. And so we called and said, hey, we're coming over to visit. And, and he came running to the, there's a window next to the door. And, you know, I locked the door, and it goes, beep, beep, you know. And his dad said, Pop Pop's here. And he just, he just ran to the door, just barely touching the ground. And he was just like, he was just coming out of himself. He was just laughing uncontrollably and just like shaking and just laughing. And he came to the door. He's like, you know, just Pop Pop's here. Right? Like he was just so excited. He couldn't contain him. It was just coming out of him, just laughing, you know. And, um, you know, isn't that like... Like, I couldn't, I just can't, I'm telling you the story because I just, I don't know that there was any better experience you could have. You know, I'm, I'm just getting ready to knock on the door. You know, it's a little different than that Revelation 3.20 greeting that the church gave Jesus. You know, he stood at the door and they knocked and he's like, whatever. Who's, you know, they, like, he was outside, Jesus was outside the church knocking on the door. Right? And what a, what a, our delight, our delight, right, is to be so excited to do God's will. Amen? Is there anybody there? So notice here, I want to read this in Psalm 40, starting in verse 6. I think we have it up on the screen. But notice he says, sacrifice and offering is not what you desired. Well, what do you mean? I think of all the bulls, all the rams, all the lambs, all the turtle doves, all those animals that were sacrificed, and now you're going to tell us that that's not what you desired? No. Really, one commentator said about this verse that it was not a bloody sacrifice that God desired, but an obedient heart. Right? It's not, God wasn't really looking for sacrifices. He wanted people's hearts that desired him. People that wanted to please him. Mine ears have you opened. Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me, I delight this is a prophetic proclamation. I delight to do thy will. I delight to do the desire of your heart, O oh God. I desire to do what you desire. My will is in line with your will. I want to do what pleases you, O oh God. O oh my God, yea, your law is written within my heart. It's stamped. It's embossed upon my heart. It's in me, it's in the depths, it's in the fiber, it's in the fabric of my being. I want to do what pleases you, O oh God. I have preached righteousness in the great congregation. Lo, I have not refrained my lips, O oh Lord. You know, I have not hid your righteousness within my heart. I have declared your faithfulness. I have declared your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed 
your loving kindness and your truth from the great congregation. Wow, what a verse, right? What a verse, what a proclamation, right? And, you know, God is not so pleased with a bloody sacrifice as he is an obedient heart, right? It's not the 10,000 rams, right? Did you ever read of all that David brought unto the Lord and sacrificed unto the Lord and Solomon and the coronation of the, the new temple, all that was sacrificed, right? It, it wasn't that that brings tears to our God's eyes, right? But a tender heart, a tender heart that hears and sees and is attentive to God's will. That's what pleases our God, right? What, what an example Jesus Christ was of a surrendered heart, right? A, a heart, a will that was surrendered unto the Father. How many times did he say, not my will be done, but thy will be done. It's not my words, but the words I get, I receive from the Father. It's not the works that I do for you, O God. It's what you've asked me to do, right? Everything was given back to the Father. Everything that Jesus did when he was on this earth reflected a surrendered heart. A heart that was setting an example for you and I to do his will. To do it not because we have to, not because it's been commanded, not because I'm supposed to, not because grandma said to do it, not because pop pop said to do it, but because the desire of my heart is to do that which pleases him. I want to make my father smile. Amen? And, you know, Jesus... I, I always say this, just as we just sang. The greatest ability is availability. Availability. Lord, I'm here. I desire to do your will. Use me. Right? When you play sports, say, coach, put me in. I just want to be used of you. Here's my hands. Here's my feet. Here's my knees. Here's my heart. Here's my ears. Sanctify them, O oh God. Use them for your glory and your purpose. You know, I'm not much, Lord, but what I am, I give to you. Right, I'll never, I'll never forget, and you've heard me tell the story. I can't help but tell it again. And I was in Mumbai, and we were in what they call the slums, right? And it's, it's places where people... You go to Bombay, India, and, and when I was there, you know, in, in late 90s, um, you know, when, when you go there, it, it's just, it really is an unbelievable place. The first thing when you arrive there, you just notice the smell, and there's just stuff burning everywhere. People have little fires and burning and all little two-stroke engines, their little cars, and beep, 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 you know, honking, and the sounds, the smells, the air, it's just thick with smoke and just, you know, and, and everybody's carrying something. Like they're carrying it on their head. They're walking, they're, they're carrying a, a, a palm branch, right? A board, a piece of plastic. Like you start looking around, you go, this is so odd. And you go to those ghettos and they have houses, little, you know, two-room houses, made out of a piece of cardboard, a piece of plywood, a palm branch, a piece of bla plastic, right? A little scrap of metal, piece of tin, all pieced together, and people live there. And there's like thousands and thousands of these settlements. I guess you could call it a settlement. And every few months, they just come in with bulldozers and bulldoze it down. And they start over again because they have no place to go, right? And, and they're just in the slums. And one of the missionaries that we support, Pastor Ganesh, ministers there. We, we, give, we send him money. He, he, he texts me all the time, you know, on WhatsApp. He's texting me and telling me what he's doing, right? And, and we were there and, and people were, there was a guitar, playing guitar and singing and 
there was one lady there and she was just, her hands were raised and she was just singing at the top of her lungs. And as she sang out, her face was dusty and tears were going down and you could, you know, see the dust because the tears were going down and just cleaning the dust off because just it's just filthy dirty everywhere be like kind of like building a little tree fort in a in a dump right and she that's where her house is and her three kids right and she was just worshiping god and i was so touched i i said pastor ganesh like what what is she saying and he said she and he listened and she he said She's saying, in this life, Lord, I don't have much, but in the life to come, give me a little place next to you. And I just wept, right? Her desire, her desire was to do what pleased her heavenly father, right? Living in a slum with her little children sleeping on the ground with a little bit of cardboard and plastic and tin, you know, three children, right? And just think of that kind of heart, right? You know, sometimes when we think, well, what is your will? What is the will of God? God, what is it that you want from me? Has anybody ever cried that out? In the midst of a trial, in the midst of a difficult time? God, what do you want from me? Is there anybody here? A couple times, a couple times it, it happened. Like, what do you want from me, God? It's not enough? I want a surrendered heart. It's not about what you're doing. It's not about what you're going through. Pastor Boone, we, we got that one together, right? Going through. He always tells us, remember, we're going through it. Not staying in it. We're going through it. We're going to get through. A surrendered heart. A surrendered will. A tender heart that reverences God. Right? We've been talking a little bit this week in a couple Bible studies about 2 Peter chapter 1. Right? We talked about adding to your faith virtue to virtue Knowledge to knowledge, temperance to temperance, patience to patience, godliness, godliness, a reverence for God that produces active obedience that I, I want to do the best that I can to do his will. That's godliness, right? Amen? Sometimes it would be much easier if God could just make us a list, just give me you know, just give me, well, I like five. I like the number five, right? Because I got one, two, three, four, five, right? I was teaching my grandson that. One, two, three, four, five, right? So I showed Timmy the video. But, you know, like, I, you know, ten, that's too much sometimes. I can't keep track of ten things. But give me five things, right? Today, is it okay if I talk about five things? Rutherford, can I talk about five things? Because sometimes I just want a list. Give me, make it a little easier for me. But you know what God, God has us do? He wants us to prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. Look here in Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Place your life upon the altar. Right? Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, 1 John 3, 16. So ought, so ought, can you say so ought? So ought. so ought we to lay down our lives for one another. What's that called? A surrendered life, a sacrificed life, right? I beg you, Paul writes, I beg you, after all the theology I just taught you, Brothers, sisters, by the mercy of God, present your bodies, I beg you, as a living sacrifice, holy, set apart, acceptable, approved unto God, which is your 
reasonable or logical service after all that God has done for us. Knowing who he is, what he has done for us, it's logical. It's our reasonable service to give all of our life for him, right? And then he says, be not conformed, right? Don't, don't try to, you know, it's easy to get caught up in a lot of outward accoutrements. Is that actually a word? Accoutrements. You know, we can get caught up in all the outward stuff. You know what God wants? God's looking at the heart. Amen. He's not so concerned. Listen, don't, don't live your life for people. Amen. Don't live your life focused on all the outward accoutrements. Give God your heart. Amen. He says, my son, give me your heart. Amen. I want the heart. Give me your heart. Don't worry about... Don't worry about, you know, well, I, I didn't cut myself shaven. I didn't quite get this spot over. I'm not worried about that. Give me your heart. I want your heart. Will you give me your heart? Amen? Amen. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Metamorphosis, inward transformation, right? We, we believe in transformation. People's lives get changed by Christ, transformed by Christ. I believed in Jesus Christ. I received his word. My mind was renewed. I've been transformed from the inside out. And because he changed my life, because he did everything for me, now it's my logical, reasonable service to give my life for him, to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Amen. Take me. Take my voice. Take my hands. It's not much, but all I have, I offer you, God. Amen. Isn't that the calling? Amen. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, perfect, and acceptable will of God. You know what's beautiful about this? You get to prove it out. It's not because I'm going to give you five points today. You prove it out. You, I was sharing with the staff this week. It's so important for you to know who you have been designed by God to be. Make your calling and election sure in 2 Peter 1.10. Understand what your gifts are. What are the gifts that God gave to you? How did God hardwire you? What is your temperament? What has God designed you in the very way that he created you? You're fearfully and wonderfully made in Psalm 139. He made you, right? Discover your calling. The purpose for which you've been placed on this earth, it's above every other earthly thing that you will ever do. To know why God designed you, what he made you for, and he gave you gifts and talents and abilities, and he's given you a purpose and a calling that's above everything else. And if you find that, right, life is worth living. Right? And no matter what happens, it's you keep your eye on the prize. You keep your eyes on Christ. You focus on him. And you fulfill the calling that God has given unto you. Amen? Amen? And that's your good, perfect. And you get to prove it out. No one else gets to tell it to you. It's something between you and the Lord. You get to prove what is that good, perfect, acceptable will of God. Amen? And living in the will of God is not just about what you do or what you have done. It's about desiring. It's about desiring to do what pleases God, what God wants me to do, right? And Jesus is a supreme example. He did his Father's will. He was on this earth, and there was one thing, nothing else ever took preeminence above it. One thing took preeminence in Jesus' life. He wanted to fulfill the will of his father. The father gave him a job to do, and he came to do it, and nothing would distract him. He said, I, I am determined. I'm going to go. His, his face was set like a flint toward the cross. He said, I'm going to go, and I'm going to finish the work that the father sent me to do. I'm going to go to Calvary. 
and it's going to be painful. It's going to be physically painful. It's going to be emotionally painful. It's going to hurt because everybody's going to scatter. And the people that I love so dearly are going to be scattered. And I'm going to hang on that cross alone and I'm going to bear the sins of the whole world in my body. But as the sky went dark and Jesus cried out, Eli, Eli, lame sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? After that he could say, it is finished. From eternity past uh, into eternity future, all sins of all mankind, I bore them in my body. I provided eternal reconciliation and redemption for whosoever would believe in me. Jesus shed his blood so that you would not have to. He paid the price. He gave it all. He laid it all down. And he says, would you follow my example? Would you do that which delights the Father? Would you? I, I lived my life. I modeled an example of how to please the Father. I gave it all. He's not asking us to do that. He did all of that for us. But now he's asking us to follow his example. Amen? Right? He, he, and it really isn't about what we do. It really comes down to this simple thing. Are, are you willing, are you willing to, do, to put him first and love him most? Isn't that what he said to Peter? Peter grabbed the boys after, G, after Jesus you know, was resurrected and ascended up. He said, hey, guys, I'm going back fishing. What are we going to do? Right? I'm going fishing. Jesus came back to him and says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if he, there was just some fish laying there? And he says, Peter, do you love me more than these dead fish? Pretty, that's pretty humbling, isn't it? You know, Lord, right? God wants you to desire, to delight, to do what pleases him. Because he's done everything for us, right? And none of us are perfect. We all fall short. I love this passage. One of my favorite passages in the scripture because it really says it all. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned. We were in Adam. At, at a point in time when we were in Adam, we all sinned. And therefore, we constantly fall short. We're constantly falling short of the glory of God. Right? But... The next verse, verse 24 says, being justified freely, it's the same tenses, just as we are continually falling short, Jesus Christ is continually declaring us righteous. We're falling short and he's declaring us righteous. By his grace, through the redemption, apolutrosis, through the price that Jesus Christ paid with his own blood, he's declaring you righteous. Right? What an amazing thing, right? And there's no other way to have a right relationship with God. My service, my sacrifice, all that I do for him can never earn me a right standing, can never make me accepted in the beloved. It was only Jesus Christ's blood and his declaration toward me, declaring me righteous, that makes me righteous, giving me a right standing before God. And you know what? We fall short. Yesterday we were with the men. And we talked a little bit out of 2 Samuel chapter 23. And we talked about King David. And with all respect and reverence, we talked about the reality that his family, his, his life was a wreck. Started off well. The little shepherd boy that just made up songs and sang songs and worshipped God out in the field. And when Jesse came and there was a coronation, Samuel said, listen, one of your sons, Jesse, is going to be the king over Judah. The king over Israel. and He's going to unify the kingdoms. It's all going to come together. He's going to be king over all Israel. Jesse brought all his sons in. And there was a coronation. One of them's going to be crowned king. I mean, we probably had a bath, put our best clothes on. Came to the oldest, tall, handsome. 
Samuel was waiting to anoint him. God said, no, not him. He says, oh. Moves to the next one. No, not him. Not him. Went down all, through all the sons. It was none of them. Because God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And he says, we got a problem here. You got any more sons? God told me one of your sons is going to be anointed king. He said, well, I mean, there's David. He's out there with the sheep singing his songs. The sweet psalmist of Israel said, you better go get him because that's the one God chose. And he was out there just, he didn't care. Coronation going, oh, you guys go ahead. I'll just be out here singing songs to God. And they brought him in and they coronated him king. Right? He was, had a tender heart. He had that sweet spirit. Went through a th few things with Saul. Right? Spent some years in the caves of Abdullam. Saul was trying to kill him. Had some problems with Saul's daughter. That marriage didn't quite work out. Was difficult time. Right? Sees Bathsheba bathing. 2 Samuel 12. Calls for her. You know the story wasn't a good picture. He feels guilty, most likely. Has one of his half-sons. I hate to even mention it in public. Rape one of his, ha his daughters. Didn't deal with it. One of the other brothers was so angry, he killed Amnon for raping Tamar. He was so angry, he killed him. David still wouldn't deal with it. It was a mess, right? We talked about this yesterday. God wouldn't allow him. He became a man of war. He was in all kinds of wars. God wouldn't allow him to build his temple, but he put the dream within his heart. But then notice what God says about him. Acts 13, 22. When he, what am I talking about? We constantly fall short. But in 2 Samuel chapter 23, you know what it says? God would not forget the covenant that he made with the house of David. David made a mess of things. He started off well. He made a mess of things. And God said, my love is greater than your failure. My mercy is greater than your sins. My grace and my loving kindness supersedes anything that you could ever do wrong. I will, just like he says in the New Testament, I will never... No, never, ever leave you or forsake you. He says to, about David, when he had removed him, he raised up unto them. David, speaking of Saul, I'm sorry. When he had removed Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king. To whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart which shall fulfill all my will. See, what, what are we talking about? In David's heart was this desire to please God, and despite his shortcomings, his failures, his mistakes, the problems, his, the desire of his heart was to do God's will. And you know what? God was willing to overlook a lot of faults and failures because of the heart of David that was willing to do God's will. How about this one? 1 Kings 15, 5. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Right? Like David was... Far from perfect, yet God saw his heart. And because his heart delighted in the Lord, the Lord was willing to overlook his faults and mistakes that he made. And because of the blood that Jesus Christ would ultimately shed to pay for the sins of the whole world. What am I, what am I saying? Am I trying to condone sin? Not at all. God forbid. Right? Right? What I'm saying is the heart of God. God is looking for people who have tender hearts that reverence him and want to do his will. They want to please him. 
So here's the short list. Can I give you a short list? Okay, thanks, Rutherford. Right? If you want to do, like sometimes we just need to put a target on the wall. Like we're trying to figure it out, say like, give me, I don't know, what is God's will? What does God want me to do? Can you say that? You can do better than that. Come on, Marie. I'm picking on her. What does God want for me? Here you go. How about this one? Have faith in God. Trust in God, believe in God, acknowledge God, have a reverence for God. Know, know in your heart that God is, is here. He's with you, he's here, he sees, he hears, he knows, he's omnipotent, right? And be thankful for all that he's done for you, right? Say, well, how, why do you pick that? Well, because the scriptures do. Right? How about this verse? 1 Timothy 2.4. God, who will have all men to be saved. It is God's will for people to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. Right? Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom in Proverbs 9.10. Right? Solomon said it in Ecclesiastes 12. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. The wisest man on the earth. What did he say? Fear God. Keep his commandments. Or may I say, do your best to do God's will. Do your best. This is the whole duty of man. Reverence God. Have a healthy respect for God. Know that God, everything you do, he sees. He hears. He knows everything about your thoughts. Psalm 94, 11, He knows your thoughts afar off. There's nothing hid from his sight. Amen? Does that give you a reverence? It does for me. Right? God is present. He hears. He sees. He knows. Believe in him. Trust in him. Acknowledge him in the morning and all throughout the day. Right? Have a healthy respect and reverence for him. Because God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it's good or evil. And thank God he has paid in full for our sin. How about this one? 1 Thessalonians 5.1 to conclude number one, right? It says, what does it say? I'm 5.18. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give thanks. Notice what it says. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Amen. Know God, acknowledge God, have reverence for God, and be thankful in all things. Amen. Amen? Second thing, live out your faith. It's wonderful to say, I believe in God, I acknowledge God, I trust in God, I reverence God. But you know what? It's not enough just to say it. God wants us to live out our faith. We were talking this week in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. Grace and peace are multiplied unto us through the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The word knowledge is epinosis. It means I apply what I know. When I apply what I know, grace and and peace are multiplied unto me. And in the next verse, all things that pertain unto life and godliness are given unto me through the knowledge, epinosis. When I apply what I know, if I know just a little about God, when I, when I apply what I know, grace and peace and all things that pertain to life and godliness are available to me. Right? James 1.22 says, I love this passage, it says, but be ye doers, be ye doers of the word. I, I love the book of Mark. Mark, you know, portrays Jesus as an ox. He, he was on the move, right? You'd, you'd, you know, it would have been a long day to follow Jesus. He was on the move, up early, meeting with the Father, getting his battle plans ready, and he was everywhere, ministering to people. We see in Matthew Chapter 4, he went to every city, town, and village throughout all Galilee, all around his hometown. 
He was all around that lake. He was going to every village talking to people, healing all manner of sickness and disease, right? We see it in the book of Acts all throughout Judea, right? Jesus was on the move. He was a doer. Can you say Jesus was a doer? He was a doer of the word, not a hearer only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, not a doer, he's like a man who beholds his natural face in a glass, and he beholds himself, goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. Right? You know how it is sometimes, you know, you, you look in the mirror, and, and, and you, you know, I look and I say, oh, my lipstick is smudged. You didn't even know I wore lipstick. Right? You know, I, I didn't get my eyelash on correctly. You know, and, I'm trying to, and, and then I just forget to fix it. I look in the mirror, and I know I, I need to correct that, but I don't take care of it, right? And, you know, I look in the mirror, and I look at my hair, and I just go, it just is what it is. I mean, it just, I try fixing it. It's just, maybe I need to go to Pastor Larry's style, a haircut, you know? Chris, I need to follow Chris, Pastor, look, all these guys, they all look so handsome. My hair is just going, bleh. But who, whoever looks into the, the perfect law of liberty, what's that perfect law of liberty? God's perfection, his mercy, his grace, all of his perfections, right, and continues therein. When, when you behold him, when you focus on the perfection of God and the totality of who he is, the sum total of all his attributes, right, and you continue therein, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. You see, doing, living out your faith, applying what you know about God is the will of God. If you just know a little bit about God, you just say, I, I, I don't really know how to pray, but I know that I'm going to follow that pattern in Matthew chapter 6. I'm going to have reverence for God, and I'm going to say a little prayer unto God, right? And God hears that prayer. He multiplies, you know, grace and peace and makes access to all things pertaining unto life and godliness, right? And nowhere, nowhere is living out the will of God, right, more evident than in our relationship with other people. Loving one another, forgiving one another, right? Serving one another, forgiving one another. Pastor Jeff, you already said that. Uh-huh, exactly. Because you might have to do it more than once. And loving one another, and praying for one another, and serving one another, and forgiving one another, right? I love this in Micah 6, 8. The prophet writes, he says, He has showed you, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly. Do the best you can. When you know something is right, do what is right. Right? And love mercy. Be thankful that God is very merciful. And patient with us. And walk humbly before your God. Amen? Amen? Third thing I think is really important. It's the will of God. Right? Is to share our faith. Listen, there's a lot of, lot of harsh voices in the world in which we live today. They would love to silence your voice. They would love to intimidate you from obeying the command of Jesus to just keep quiet about your faith. Go take your candlestick and take it to your closet and hide it. Don't let anyone know that you're a believer in Jesus. But this is what Jesus said. Jesus came and spake unto them and said, All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things 
whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Right? Teach all nations. It means make disciples. Making disciples is a command in that passage. And going, teaching, and baptizing is how we make disciples. We're on the move. We're going someplace. And when we're going, you know what we do? We bring people with us. And we go to where people are. Hello? Do you, do you know what I'm saying? You know, like, I know there's a, a modern, you know, church movement. And it's, it has sometimes, in some circles, it has this philosophy. Hey, they know where the church is. And if they want to come, they'll come. And you know what? I look at the Gospels and I see Jesus going where the people were. Amen. And you know what? I, I, you know, I don't know. I just, I just kind of look at the Gospel of John and I see Jesus going and picking one by one and meeting one-on-one -on -one with disciples. John 2, he was there at a wedding and he met his mother there, right? And he did a miracle. He brought those six guys with him. Right? And he ministered them. John 3, he was with Nicodemus. He went by night and he spent time with Nicodemus and he helped him out. Though he was a rabbi, a teacher of rabbis, he helped him out on his theology. John 4, he walked early in the morning. I believe it was almost 30 miles to meet a woman at a well who had five husbands and the man she was living with was not her husband met her at a well. John 5, it was a man at the pool of Bethesda. John 6, he said, you know, um, Philip, you give them something to eat when he multiplied the five loaves and the two fishes. Right? John 7, he said, if any man thirsts, let him come to me. If any individual thirst, let's get together and talk about it. Amen. Right? John 8, it was a woman caught in adultery. John 9, it was a, a man that was born blind. Jesus made house calls. Jesus went to people's house. He sat where people were sitting. Right? Ezekiel 3.15, the prophet talked about it. Sit where they sit. Amen? We, we had, listen, we just sang it. I saw you. Your arms were up. You were worshiping. Right? And we said, I am available. How about available to make house calls? How about bring communion to a shut-in go to someone's house and bring communion i was talking with a friend this week his job now he 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 is on the phone and he talks to terminal uh people that have terminal illnesses and and he talks all day long to people that have terminal illnesses he's a chaplain and he talks on the phone with people that are that are gonna that are terminal right and he just he just gets on the phone and Zooms with them and if they're able or just talks on the telephone. You know what? There's, you know, anybody here could, could do this. You know what? We want to be available. You know, somebody once said this. They said, you know that revival has broken out in the church when the people go to the pastor and say, Pastor, what could I do to help? Amen? Amen? And some people, then, and I've heard people say, well, we went to the pastor and we asked him and he said, I'll get back to you. And he never got back to you. Well, then ask him again. And if he doesn't get back to you again, ask him again. And if he doesn't get back to you, call me. No, I'm teasing. But it's true, right? Hey, you know, let your voice be heard. Amen? Jesus said, go everywhere. Teach all nations. Speak the truth in love. Fulfill the great commission. Right? Proverbs 25, 11, A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Can I tell you something? There are certain things that happen in my life I will never forget. And they're sitting right here in this room. I'll never forget when I was at the Cecil County Fair and we were passing out tracks. This kind of odd-looking fella came up and asked me a question, you know. And he said, oh, what church do you go to? And I told him. She, he said, is the pastor any good? I said, I think he's pretty good. 
man, look at the guy sitting right down here today, right? 27 years later, 26 years later, and his beautiful wife, he really married up, I'm telling you. <laughs> or the time, my precious friends that are here often is, it, when I come is Jeff Ritter, you know? And, and we sat at his kitchen countertop, kind of leaned on the, on the counter and just talked about Jesus. And he received Christ. He was born again. Or maybe when I met Lori over here in the neighborhood when I lived right across the street and said, oh, that's a beautiful patio. And we started a little conversation. I had my little Gabe with me and we were talking and ended up talking about the store. And I, a couple months later, I thought, man, these guys gave us their store and I've never even followed up, you know, and said, hey, Mark, I'd like to get together. Maybe we could have lunch. And he came over. I was running a little late. And I came out of the office, and I walked across the hall to the boardroom, and there was a Bible sitting on the table. And he had that Bible in his hand. He said, so, Pastor, what's this book all about anyway? Remember that day? And we sat there, and we talked for two hours about the Bible. And we did it every Wednesday. I'd come to their house at 9 o'clock, and we'd sit there and talk about the Bible, and they served in this church so faithfully, such precious friends. You go and you sit with somebody, you share, you know, words of gold in pictures of silver. You'll never forget. It'll be the most rewarding thing. People like Joan Shields. Do you know Joan Shields? And she's, she's in pain and she's hurting right now. She's one of the most precious ladies who sat with people and people and people and people and people and people. Can you say it? And people. And she sat with people. And oh to God that someone would go to her house and sit with her and Joseph and just be a comfort and a peace to them. That's, what, that's the gospel. That's the gospel. That's how we live. Can someone say amen? amen? Right? This is the will of God. Amen? How about this one? Number four. Okay? This is the will of God, even, our, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication or sexual immorality, that every one of us should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. This is, it says it straight out, this is the will of God. This is the will of God. God, God desires from us that he would be more precious to us than sexual immorality. We live in a world, okay, that is infiltrated and inundated with sexual immorality. It's all around us, okay? It, it is destroying young people's lives. And older people as well. But it is, you have no idea. We don't talk about this in the church. It is so destructive. It's, it's destroying people from the inside out. And they don't, they don't know how to talk about it. They don't know where to go. Right? And God says, I want you to flee fornication. 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he that commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. What? Don't you know? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which you have of God? You are not your own. We have been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You say, Pastor, it's easier said than done. I know. We, are all, we all have temptations. How do you get free? We, we talk often about replacement. Listen, feast on the lamb. Be partakers of the divine nature. Gather together with the body of Christ. Be in the word. Be around people in the word. Right? Right? You know, you, know what, you know what we can all agree on? We don't have problems when we're with the body of Christ. When we're together with the people of God feasting on the Lamb, we don't have those problems, do we? Can someone say amen? Right? It's when we get out alone. 
right? And if, you know, well, anyway, I won't get too carried away. Listen, Ephesians 5.3, but fornication, all uncleanness, Ephesians 5.3, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as saints. 2 Timothy 2.22, flee also youthful lust, but notice the replacement. Flee youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. See, that's the key. Get, get involved. Be in fellowship. Feast on the Lamb. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Be around people that are involved in God's Word and God's work and God's love and be around the brethren. You know what? And those, those other inordinate desires, they just vanish away. Right? It's a replacement. Amen? And by the way, can I just say this? We've already made it really crystal clear. We're always falling short. Not just in this area, in many areas. Christ, Jesus Christ's blood paid the price in full for your sin. So if, if, you, if you've sinned, and we all do, the scriptures are clear in that, then number one, you confess your sin. You say, Lord, Forgive me. I don't know what I was thinking. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Wash me. Renew me. Change me. And then number two, you get in the word. John 15, 3. Yeah. Right? You're clean through the word that Jesus has spoken. Get in the word. Dig into the word. Read the word. Listen to it on your phone. You say, oh, those phones are evil. We'll use it for good. I love the version Bible app. You know, they should give me a, they should send me checks. I, I, I talk about this version Bible app all the time, right? I was with 50 ladies up in Coleraine at a, at a women's conference yesterday, and I was telling, they were all downloading it. You know, I had to get a, I had to get a commission on that. Right? You're clean through the word. Right? And then number three, 1 John 1, 7, when you have fellowship one with another, it seems to activate the blood of Christ to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Walk in the light as he is in the light. There's something healing about being with the brethren. I, I love to just get up in the morning, have a cup of coffee with Mark, and just look into his eyes, and he looks into my eyes. Pastor Larry, we look in, I was out with Chris on Tuesday night, and we just look into one another's eye and sit across the table from one another. Something healing about that, something cleansing about that. It, it activates the blood of Christ. We hold one another accountable. Amen? And it activates the cleansing. Number five, I'm closing right here. Embody, embody a spirit of generosity, charity, and giving. You know what? I love this, this statement Ken Blanchard made. Say, who's Ken Blanchard? Doesn't matter. I just like what he said, okay? He said, you finally have become an adult. You finally have grown up when you realize that life is more about what you give than what you get. It's not about what you get. It's about what you give, Right? I love how it's written in Acts 20, 35. He wrote, I have showed you all things, how that working hard, you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, how he said, how Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than receive. That's awesome, isn't it? Hey, I, I want to close with this. I just want you to think about this. Can you imagine what it would be like if our church had a testimony? If we had a testimony in the community and people said, oh, where do you go to church? Oh, life community. Oh, life community? That's that church. That, those are those people that are willing to help anybody at any time, anywhere. Oh, life community. Oh, life community. That's that group of people. They're willing to help anybody at any time, anywhere. I mean, isn't that our mission statement? We help people know Jesus personally and serve him passionately. 
I mean, wouldn't that be an awesome testimony to have in the community that this, this church has been mobilized to go into all the community, all the world, everywhere around us, and help people know Jesus personally and serve him passionately? I love that. You know, I, I'm excited. I shared a little testimony with you about, about Pastor Ganesh but we're supporting missionaries. That was one thing when we sold our building. We said, you know what? This is something that we started doing 30 years ago, and, and we really had to discontinue our, our missionary support. I mean, we didn't have to, but it, was, it, it seemed at the time that it wasn't possible because we didn't have the money. And what a blessing it is to support missionaries around the world. You are a part of that. That's what we do. We help people. We, we send people with the gospel to help others know Jesus Christ personally and to serve him passionately. Amen? So, hey, have faith in God. Acknowledge God. Reverence God. Be thankful for all he's done for you. Live out your faith. Apply what you know about God and walk in truth. Share. Share your faith in God. And this is the will of God, even our sanctification even sexual purity. And number five, embody a spirit of generosity, charity, giving. This is a short list, right? Lord, our desire is to do what pleases you. Put these desires in our heart. Let us be passionate about doing what pleases God. Amen. Wow, wasn't that a great message? If this word really inspired you, share it with someone. And if you really feel encouraged to give, you can give on our website at lifecommunitychurch.net. Click on the tab that says give. We want to stay connected with you, so feel free to subscribe and also follow us on our socials so you can stay connected with us. But for now, have a great week.